All right, let's begin. Just a quick mic check. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Well, welcome everybody for a very special and important event today. We're going to be talking about compliance and AI policies and best practices. I have with me an awesome guest who has 30 minutes of his very, very busy day, who's going to be talking and walking us through the legal aspect of AI and compliance. And he happens to be an attorney. So with me, I have Andrea Natal, which I'll uh, give the floor to in a second. But before I do that, I would like to uh, just remind you to join our community on Facebook. If you haven't so, um, we broadcast all these events, reminders, new releases of VBOUT on the group. It's a very hybrid and active community. George will be putting the links in the chat so you can follow us on, on there. Um, also, we have been doing these monthly meetups since the last 10 years. They started physical location in New York, but that we moved hybrid online. So we can still provide this awesome content, not only locally, but worldwide, especially that now we have about 5,000 members on the platform scattered across uh, pretty much every demographic and geogra geography you can think of. So with that being said, uh, our community is growing and certainly the Facebook group is a great place to start. Now, I'm going to begin with, uh, I'm going to give the floor, the agenda for today is Andrea is going to start going through a presentation that he has put together. I'll have some uh, very uh, important five questions to begin. I'll uh, uh, then Andrea is going to have to have a hard uh, cut off at 530. And after that, I'm going to take on and share with you the latest laws or the, uh, the actual uh, states and countries that are implementing the laws as of today and what we should be worried about as a small business, digital marketing agency or other um, and when it comes to these laws. Now, we won't have time to ask Andrea a lot of questions, so we're going to probably have to uh, send the emails to Andrea after, so we'll share the emails as well. Thank you. Um, all right, so without further ado, I want to present Andrea to everybody, Andrea Natal uh, from Andrea Natal's law firm. Um, he is specialized in federal litigation and most recently branched into AI and compliance. Um, Andrea is... Um, is an awesome speaker. I've read the content and uh, he's has he has a lot to share with us today. So Andrea, without further ado, I'll give you the screen share so you can uh, you can begin. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for having me and for this opportunity. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea Tale. Um, as a matter of fact, I am the founder of and the managing member of the uh, law office of Andrea Natale, but I, since a couple of years, I've been working with EPGD, where I specialized in litigation and uh, corporate law. Let me explain you like the, the importance of the partnership and the synergy with EPGD, because at EPGD, we focus on helping businesses navigate complex legal challenges especially as AI transforms the regulatory landscape. Whether it is drafting policies, reviewing contracts, or defending against administrative actions, our goal is to help your business succeed in this new digital age. But before we dive into today's presentation, here is a quick overview of what we will cover. First, we will explore how AI is transforming marketing and why compliance is crucial in this new landscape. Next, we'll break down key regulatory uh, updates and look at the real world examples like Google 50 million euro fine for violating the GDPR. And finally, we will talk about how EPGD law can help your business stay compliant and avoid legal pitfalls. So I'm gonna welcome you to the future of marketing. 
where AI is driving personalized experiences and automating everything from ad campaigns to customer service. But here is the real question. Why, while AI is busy revolutionizing how we connect with consumers, are we keeping up with the rules that governs this tech? AI can predict what we want before we even know it ourselves. But without proper compliance, it is a double-edged sword. Do you know how many businesses have already paid the price for mishandling AI and data privacy? Let me show you what can happen when compliance falls behind innovation. We're about to dive into these regulations, what these regulations are, why they matter, and how we can turn AI into a compliance success story, not a ticking time bomb. Let's get into the heart of why we are here, AI regulations. As AI becomes smarter, the laws surrounded are ramping up. Think about GDPR, CCPA, the upcoming EU AI Act, and now the Algorithmic Accountability Act in the United States. These laws aren't just suggestions. They are game changers that can either boost your business or derail it. First, let's start with the well-known GDPR, the European regulation that is all about user consent and data privacy. If you're using AI to process data, you need to be crystal clear about how and why you're, you are using that data. Next, the California's CCPA, which gives consumers the power to say, no, I do not want you to using my data. With AI marketing, you have got to build systems that give users control. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room, the EU AI Act. This one is coming fast and it classifies AI systems by risk. If you're operating in Europe, high-risk AI will face serious scrutiny. You'll need human oversight, regular assessments, and bias detection built in. The EU AI Act is set to become the world's first comprehensive regulation for AI, classifying AI systems by risk level. These range from unacceptable risk and therefore banned uses like social scoring to high risk AI systems, which face the strictest requirements. High risk AI often used in sectors like healthcare or finance will require rigorous human oversight, continuous monitoring and built in bias detection to prevent discriminatory outcomes. Companies operating in Europe will also need to perform regular risk assessments to ensure compliance and mitigate potential issues. Now, what are those four risk categories that the EU AI Act provides? The, the first one is unacceptable risk. These AI systems are banned such as government social scoring or biometric surveillance. Second, high risk. And these categories are included AI in critical sectors like healthcare, law enforcement, and finance. These require stringent measures like human oversight, risk assessments, and bias monitoring. Third category, limited risk. AI systems that require transparency measures, like informing users that they are interacting with AI. For example, chatbots. So if you're using chatbots, you do have to notify the users that they are interacting with an AI system. And fourth, the fourth classification is minimal risk. 
low risk system such as AI in video games that will have little to no regulatory requirements. Next, I would like to talk to you about the United States and its Algorithmic Accountability Act, which is a bill that has not passed yet, but once passed, will require companies to evaluate their AI systems for bias, discrimination, and privacy risks. If your AI makes decisions that impact people's lives, whether it is targeting ads or offering services, this bill will enforce impact assessments. Enforcing impact assessments refers to requiring companies to perform regular evaluation of their AI systems to identify and mitigate risks related to bias, discrimination, and privacy violations. These assessments ensure that AI systems are transparent, fair, and non-discriminatory, especially in areas where AI decisions can significantly impact people, people's lives, such as employment, housing, and credit. The goal is to make sure that AI systems do not unintentionally harm individuals or groups, thereby promoting ethical and responsible use of AI. Now, imagine being hit with a 50 million euro fine. Google didn't have to imagine it, they lived it. This case was a major wake up call for companies using AI in their marketing strategies. In 2019, Google was fined 50 million euros under the GDPR for two main issues. First, not being transparent enough about how they were collecting and using personal data. And second, for failing to get valid consent from users for personalized ads. Their AI powered ad targeting system was brilliant but it lacked the compliance backbone that GDPR demands. The fine was massive, but the real damage was to Google's reputation. Transparency and consent aren't just checkboxes. They are critical to building trust with consumers and avoiding devastating fines. In the next slide, we will look at how you can avoid being the next Google with practical steps to build compliance right into your AI systems. And just to, uh, to add to that, Andrea, I guess that happened in 2019 around the GDPR implementation era. Now that we have the AI U Act, we're probably gonna see some additional lawsuits because of all the data that these AI models have processed, that probably means that Google has utilized so much information, which could potentially include bias. They have to be very clear how they got that data and how they're training the model, which they, as a commercial product, they're not providing too much transparency on that. So I'm assuming they're probably going to be hit with an additional fine in the coming, uh, in the coming few years. Um, yes. Yeah. And it seems also that uh, that they have not really changed their model. Um, so it is also possible that we'll be hit with other fines uh, under the GDPR as well. But for some folks, that could be just considered uh, the cost of doing business, given that, uh, yes, for us, $50 million would definitely break our banks. Uh, but for a giant as, uh, as Google, um, could be fairly considered as the cost of doing business. And we will see how uh, this will resonate uh, with, with the giants, Facebook, uh, OpenAI, and uh, which it seems to be like the most ethical like so far and uh, on how they share like their models and also with, with Google as well, um, because those are not just like uh, how they comply with the, uh, the EU, 
But once passed this bill in the United States, they will have to implement similar measures, especially on bias detection, yeah. um, in order to avoid these kind of pitfalls. Thank you. Uh, starting like specifically like from there, like I wanted just to uh, reconnect, and now that we have seen like the risk of non-compliance, um, I wanted to talk to you about, and I would like to paint a picture that compliance can actually be a competitive advantage, not just a uh, protection towards um, hefty fines. Because by embedding compliance into your, into your AI systems, you not only protect your business from fines, but you also build trust with your customers. I have distilled what I believe to be like four main steps of compliance in uh, like with with the AI. Or like first, transparency. Your users need to understand how their data is being used. Provide clear, concise explanations at every stage. Second, consent management. Make it simple. Ensure users can easily give and withdraw consent. Third, bias detection, what we were talking about, and that is coming up, not just in Europe, but also in the United States. Regularly test your AI for any signs of bias. AI should serve everyone equally. And fourth, human oversight. Don't let AI make all the decisions. Humans must always oversee high risk areas. Now the question for for us, but mainly like for this group that is, that is attending uh, this webinar is how many of you have a structured system for auditing your AI's decisions? If not, this is where you need to start. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually curious, uh, guys, why don't you drop in the chat and let us know what is uh, who, who here who is attending have some sort of a compliance framework. They've started some legal work on this internally. They do proper assessment for the AI uh, technologies that they have front facing with the clients like AI chatbots. Drop us in the chat, let us know. Um, that that's a, that's a good question. Thank you, Richard. Um, now let, let's move to, to the next slide in which we will dive into a step further from compliance is going to be ethical AI because mm -hmm. being compliant isn't just about avoiding fines. It is also about doing the right thing. As we said, compliance is a must and will be a must, but let's take it a step further. Ethics. Being compliant can keep you from fines, but being ethical can build trust and future proof your brand. Ethical AI is becoming the standard for companies that want to stand out. Three pillars of ethical AI. First, fairness. AI systems must treat everyone equally, and that means eliminating bias. Second, transparency. Users should know what's happening behind the scenes. Open algorithms build trust. Third, responsibility. Ensure your AI, your AI decisions reflect your brand values. Responsible AI practices aren't just good for compliance. They're good for business. Now, when we were talking about like risk proofing like your AI system, I would like to provide you with, from my perspective, like uh, practical steps on how to take your your AI systems to uh, risk proofing. 
and to ensure that they align with both compliance and ethical standards. AI can be a huge asset and we know that, but if not managed properly, it can turn into a serious liability. Let's explore the practical steps that you can take to risk-proof your AI systems and stay compliant. First, regular audits. Regularly assess your AI systems to ensure compliance and ethical use. And I cannot stress that enough. Regular audits is going to be a cornerstone for compliance. And in those regular audits, like what we're looking for is number two, bias detection. Monitor your AI for any signs of bias in decision making. And third, human oversight. AI should assist, not replace. Keep humans involved in high risk decisions, especially like in the high risk sectors as classified by the EU AI Act. Now that we have covered how to risk prove your AI systems, Let's talk about how we can help you implement these safeguards. So to be specific, guys, Andrea is talking about, from a legal perspective as a legal firm, how they could assist you with the compliance process because compliance can come in multiple fold. Right. Bebout is the platform through which you're deploying some of those AI tools like the AI chatbot and some AI decision making and intent detection. But on the other side, you need to have your legal disclaimers and terms of services buttoned up. And this is where Andrea and similar firms can assist you because Andrea, can you work with anybody or they have to be local? I, it depends on the the service. Uh, I would divide uh, our scope of services in three main areas. One is what I call like policy development. Two is uh, limit um, liability protection, and third is the defense from administrative actions. As it pertains to the corporate world, which is number one and number two, we can seriously take into consideration any company that would like to work with us for assessing risk and also reducing the impact of those risks like in their businesses. For example, by drafting policies within the firm, which is something that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, our corporate department is very accustomed to that, um, not just for AI, but in, in any sector um, and for any purpose. Like we can ensure that at least we have the paper trail of compliance, right? Like what it is required, that like we can implement it, and then we're gonna pass it on like to our employees, like our stakeholders. Then like there is the other aspect because many times like we do serve different industries, right? Like we do not serve just our own industry, and especially marketing is not marketing for marketing. Usually, it's marketing for legal marketing for healthcare, marketing for finance, especially like for those marketing agencies that they provide their services to uh, high risk industries, according to the AI, mm -hmm. uh, would be good to evaluate indemnity clauses, like in their service agreements, mm -hmm. in this way that uh, they have to receive the information for compliance from their clients because of course, uh, what's going to be like the cost for complying with an industry that is not necessarily yours. I mean, granted, if you are targeting like and specializing like, in that specific sector, of course you will be required like to comply like with that sector. But in case uh, to avoid the pitfalls, the service agreements can include, and we can help you, draft clauses that limit the liability in case that the the worst case scenario is going to happen to your client right um as it pertains to uh, 
limited uh, to uh, liability protection. There is also the, the entire framework of structuring companies like on how we structure the like companies can provide a protection to your assets. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as well as uh, the, the corporate governance. Those are like the areas of corporate law that we can definitely assist. Uh, granted, we cannot uh, provide audits of your AI systems because that's not what we actually do, um, but we can definitely help you out in, uh, um, in examining like potential legal risks. And given that this is becoming a compliance issue right now um, and uh, fines are going to be involved, that's when the attorneys are going to get involved as well. Um, third of all, which is the one that I, uh, of course, cares the most, uh, that I care the most, because it's the last step, right? Um, administrative agencies action. Uh, agencies actions that are coming after you, like for fines, we can help you defend uh, with caveats, of course, like in the jurisdictions where we practice and we cover like more than 20 states uh, as of today as, as a law firm. So therefore we're very well equipped uh, at the state and the federal level, like we can, we can represent any mm -hmm. company in case that the FTC um, or any other agency will try like to impose any sanction um, for what we will try like to classify was a misunderstanding or that we did everything that we needed to do like to comply with the regulatory scheme uh, that they are charging us with. And um, those are very sensitive areas um, where I know that my clients really care for quality representation. And that is what we are all about here like at DPGD. I pride myself like to be part of this uh, incredible reality. And I uh, wanted to offer to your, like also to thank you for this opportunity to speak to, to the community. Um, the firm and I are willing to provide a 30 minute uh, free consultation to anybody that would like to assess uh, from a legal standpoint, their compliance, um, scheme uh, for for the AI uh, as we are talking about it today. So you are more than welcome to to reach out um, and uh, uh, I can set you up uh, with, with a free consultation with me and my team to to examine these issues. That's that's very generous of you, Andrea. So guys, I know many of you are targeting the financial industry. And I do personally work with few of you who are dar uh, targeting the medical industry. I think you should start early. We don't want it to be like GDPR, it happened and then we had to catch up and the law's out. Like the laws right now are still kind of very vague and being implemented. So to start early, and I think you should take Andrea's offer here and reach out to him for a consultation to see how will, this will impact your business. Because trust me, we've been through this rodeo before and I've seen so many of our clients just struggle figuring out uh, and panicking. Like we don't have anything on our terms of services. How do we change the opt-in and opt-out? So take Andre on his offer, 30 minute consultation with a busy attorney is, is, a, is a very generous offer. So thank you, Andrea, for this. Um, can we put your email in the, uh, in yes. the chat for everybody? Just because like this, uh, this presentation is recorded, I am, uh, I have to make a disclaimer that this presentation is for educational purposes sure. only, and that is not, uh, cannot be interpreted as, uh, any, in any way as, uh, a professional advice or services, but, um, I can, this is my email address now that I will get okay. and I will also insert it in the in the chat. This is this is great. Um and many of you already have chatbots deployed. And honestly, I, I think the jargon is is heavy for most of us, the legal jargon and um some of the stuff might not be as complicated as it looks. Like if you're doing internal testing and assessment. 
that could be a job done when you deploy the chatbot with your with your documents and and the knowledge base. Uh, test it out with all sorts of questions and stay on top of the unanswered questions or the results. Like that's that quick review can be part of your assessment. Um, you know, having disclaimers on your terms of services and privacy policies of how you're using AI to hand in that data. That's not too difficult. That's not too complicated. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is even though the jargon and the, and the legal aspect of AI is sounds complicated, the implementation early is not, it might not be as, as complicated as the jargon itself. So <laughs> that's all I have to say. Um, and Andrea, I know you have a cutoff now. Um, yes. I really appreciate uh, your, your contribution. Uh, this was great. I will take it from here with you guys. I have a quick outline of all the current laws in the countries that are implementing and enforcing this in the, like, the immediate future. So you can stay here with me and uh, I can walk you through this as well. Um, Andrea, thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, and I look forward to, to talking to you in the nearest future. Thank you. Yes. Sure. Absolutely. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Just making sure you see my screen, George. Yes, I do. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So, guys, honestly, it's it's a take, take them up on the, on this offer. Um, speak for them for thirty minutes to see. Maybe they'll tell you that you need to engage further. Maybe they won't, but um, I think it's it's worth it's worth taking them on this offer. So, by the way, this presentation that we put together is going to be sent by George, so you guys can repurpose it for your own community if you're an agency. Or if you're a business and you want to internally share it with your stakeholder, we've put together a very solid presentation on importance of AI and compliance. Um, you know, obviously why, what drives responsible AI investments. And this is why our presentations usually are content rich, not only visual, because when you repurpose these presentations, you will have the material in front of you versus just spoken as, as um, uh, you know, Andrea was doing, it was just a presentation. So with that being said, uh, let's just cover real quick what current countries have actual laws in place that we need to worry about. And I already know, I mean, you already know we covered a couple. We have the UAI Act, so I'll breeze through this one in terms of the classification. This one already, um, you know, we're signed and it's going to be in effect. It's already in effect in a way. Uh, it's the most comprehensive AI regulation across the world, pretty much. Um, it introduces compliance requirements for risky AI systems. And like he broke it down into three categories, um, the unacceptable, meaning if a government is using social scoring to pick certain people, that's one category of social scoring, uh, that's unacceptable. AI it technically cannot be used there. High is in medical, financial, things that are extremely sensitive. They have stricter compliance. And then the minimal, uh, we can fall and probably we fall under the minimal category. So if any of you is actually selling in the EU, they need to understand which category they fall under and they should start implementing AI compliance um, a transparency, proper audits, pretty much immediately. Now, AI systems interacting with users follow transparency obligations um, because, the, honestly, the fines are not that fun. <laughs> Although you have some time to implement, this is not happening like right now. Uh, I think they're given around two to three years to implement this to be fully compliant, unless you're in government. Uh, or in law enforcement or something of that sort. But the fines are quite hefty, guys. So I think they're saying it's 35 million euros or 7% of your worldwide annual, annual turnover. And while many of you might not be there in terms of revenue, but hey, think big. Maybe in three years you will, and maybe you should be worried about this. Um, if lesser violations... And honestly, I don't know exactly what that means. It could be small bias decision-making and employment because you're, you're using AI to employ 
uh, you know, certain rates versus another, that could be a lesser violation and fines could be 1% of your global uh, revenue or 7.5 million euros, whichever is greater, which reminds me of the credit card fees. <clears throat> and penalty also uh, doesn't apply to one category of providers. It could uh, also for distributors and could be for contractors. So with that being said, it's very comprehensive. If you're doing business in the EU, you certainly should start getting your pieces together. All right. Now, the second compliance is uh, the United States with the blueprint for NAI Bill Right that was recently signed. Um, and look, at the end of the day, most of these regulations and laws are going to follow each other in terms of um, like transparency and you have to have proper testing and assessment. You, they're going to be copy paste overall, but I think how things are implemented at the local level is going to be different. Um, so in the United States, their focus is on uh, safety. Um, I think that's uh, their main concern. And the main purpose is to prevent discrimination. That's the number one. They don't want AI to be leading people to certain answers that could lead to discriminations, right? And that's kind of a big topic where uh, Grok from X is just giving uncensored responses while if you go to open AI, it might be very like careful and um, not necessarily leading you to one per party versus the other. Um, they also want to protect your data and, and your privacy overall, which honestly I think is going to be extremely hard because these data models are trained on videos like this one. It's trained on your social media um, uh, reels and stories. So how, how do you maintain data privacy? I think that's a, that's a big topic. Um, and especially if you work in a big organization like hospitals and, and things like that. So uh, to give you an example, there's this concept of federated uh, learning where uh, there, there is a centralized model that gets built. And by, this is from NVIDIA, by the way, just credits to them. But you have a centralized uh, global model that doesn't know exact data from a private organization. They deploy these behind a wall, a very you know tight locked wall. And then the data on the model gets trained internally, not an external server. So the server on the outside have no idea of the existing data. And then once that model gets better and better at that local level, the model sends back the information in terms of parameters, not necessarily private data, to the global model to improve itself at the global scale and then deploy it back at the local entity. I think you're gonna see more and more of these models being deployed, not only at the hospital and medical and uh, legal organizations, but I think many companies are going to deploy it locally, even companies like us, where we can run our own local model with our own data sets, keep that data private, but then have it attached to um, a global a global one, which this whole thing is called federated model. Um, anyways, more to that, I think that was a concept that was created by Google in 2008. 17, 18, uh, to focus on data privacy. Now offering clear notice and explanation about how the data is being used uh, and also how it's impacting the language model. This is, um, this is big. And providing human alternative. They don't want you to be outsourcing everything to AI. They want to have human intervention. They also want to have humans fine tuning and improving on these um, as a fallback option. Again, I think the idea here is to give you, the actual civilian, uh, the rights and equal opportunities across the board because you don't want to go look for a job and you don't get hired because the model or the AI they've deployed has some discriminatory um, you know, content in there. So that's that's one. Or maybe you apply for health insurance and you get denied. 
or perhaps your credit and your credit score, um, you know, you get you get the, the client for mortgage because <laughs> um, they're using AI. And trust me, financial industries are on the forefront of the of this to identify risks, to assess, um, you know, certain um, attributes and in, in the long term financial models. They deploy AI heavily. <clears throat> So that's, these are the two top ones that are worth looking at. Now, if I am gonna zoom down in the United States, because many of you are selling uh, locally in the United States, the Color Colorado Privacy Act, which will take effect in 2026, is basically the first US law regulating AI systems focusing on discrimination. Okay, again, we come back to the same jargon repeating itself. Um, now they're saying that developers, they need to properly test their data and their language models. So if you're not developing this, maybe that's not necessary. If you're using those models to make decisions, you need to have your internal team properly assess the results to make sure there's no bias. And because we're using APIs, sometimes we don't even know that the API we're using is actually um, <laughs> you know, has, is, is faulty. Um, so these are questions that we're starting to ask here at, at VBout, building technologies. And I think it's worth uh, you doing that the same on your end. Now, insurers using AI must prevent unfair discrimination. I think I said this, especially in insurance. That was a big topic from yesterday's debate. It's about insurance. Um, but insurance across the board, not only health insurance, probably car insurance and flood insurance and uh, all sorts of, of those. And they say to implement governments, governance, I'm sorry, to conduct testing and report the division of insurance to protect consumers from a discriminatory AI outcomes. Big words, big words. But we kept that in this interview, in this presentation, sorry. So you have the content if you'd like to repurpose it. All right, let's talk about Illinois. I think Illinois has a stricter AI compliance. Uh, and I think particularly in job interviews, they're, they're big on that. The law is clear. They don't want you to um, use AI extensively in job interviews. I don't know if it's completely banned or if you do it, you have to be like in full compliance right off the bat. Uh, so if you're a company using AI in the hiring process, you must look into this uh, if you're in Illinois. Also in their biometric, the BIPA, they call it, uh, meaning if you are doing facial recognition, if you're doing uh, you know, thumbnail um, or biometric tracking, you have to be going by the law as well. And you see how things are slightly fragmented in the United States, where every, every uh, state will have its own local laws and some things they focus on more than others, whereas the EU is covering the entire uh, European Union. Not the UK, by the way. The UK is not yet covered by this. Now, Canada is big on, uh, on AI, and while their law is not new, I think they started a little earlier in 2021, I think the, beside the fact that they share the same concept of data privacy and high impact AI systems, they're really trying to push from the start, like the, the innovation of these models should begin with compliance, not build them and figure out how to be compliant later, um, which I think is a good approach for this. But Canada has been across the board from day one, they have a lot of laws for data privacy, even for email, it's very tough to call the email people and they're following suit with this AI um, compliance stuff. Uh, again, conducting risk assessment, establish risk mitigation measures and ensure continuous monitoring. So how do you do each one of these? I think I'm gonna leave you with some some of those uh, to ask Gemini or ChatGPT, how do I do my risk assessment? Can you create a little Excel or you know a, a little table of how I can do it? You can get those templates created strictly for your business uh, with ChatGPT, for example. 
And I think the idea is they should be very transparent of disclosing information about the functioning intending uh, intended use and risk management of these of these tools. <clears throat> we have a few more here, and I'll take questions. Uh, China, obviously, they are on the frontier of AI. And quite frankly, if you look on GitHub and, and other places, uh, th they are pushing some real good technology, open sourcing a lot of it. Um, of course, be careful what you're downloading out there. You don't want to be <laughs> farming um, or you don't want to become a proxy, you know, or your server to become a proxy. Uh, but just the 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 laws that they're pushing and the innovation they're pushing is very impressive. Um, so obviously it applies on Gen AI that provides services for the public. And Alibaba is, uh, by the way, a big driver of new AI innovation. And I think they cover the entire, um, you know, at every, every territory in China. So they require those companies uh, using or building Gen AI to protect user input information and use usage records. Um, that's that's one. I collect and retain personal information in accordance to the principles of minimization and necessity, meaning don't collect more data than you can because if you build technologies, you understand that sometimes you can collect a lot more information than the user know they are giving out. So I think they're trying to minimize that external extra data collection to establish ways by which you can handle complaints, which is almost like the GDPR. If somebody wants to know how much information you have, you can pull that information or put a request and the vendor need to give you um, that stuff. <clears throat> All right. So these are the countries that have actual laws that have passed and they're going to take effect pretty much immediately with some time frame for you to implement and be compliant. Um, now, some countries that have an AI framework that's not necessarily legally binding, you have Brazil AI Bill of Rights from what we've gathered. It's not enforced. Even though there's already in Brazil a law for data privacy and how you handle data, this is still almost like a framework that falls underneath that main law. Um, but overall, they're pushing innovation when it comes to AI. The UK AI Safety Summit, UK does not have any laws as of now from what I gathered as well, uh, but they did push on the safety aspect of AI, AI deployment. The Saudi Arabia AI Ethics Principle, which is actually close enough to being a law because I think they deployed it under an umbrella that's already enforced, uh, but it's still quite vague and they're catching up. And that applies to, by the way, um, the United Emirates, UAE. They, they are pushing some laws towards that. <clears throat> Australia AI ethics framework, again, just a framework for innovation, no binding laws if you are selling there or deploying products there. Uh, and South Korea's national strategy for AI. Um, so it, it starts with a framework. It follows with a binding law. Uh, and I think everybody follows the big guys. So the EU first, the United States, um, China, and now everybody's going to probably copy some of those, um, some of those laws. So these are these are the ones that I think are worth you looking into in terms of like where we stand in terms of AI and compliance. Um, and by the way, many of you are asking if I'm going to be providing this presentation. Yes, I will. You'll have the entire thing and the recording sent back to you. So make sure you're signed up to our Facebook group. But now I want to open the floor here to kind of understand how does this affect us? All this nice and dandy. How does it affect us and how can we take action? So I know that we talked briefly about it with the attorney, um, but honestly, we can start taking action today, um, not internally in terms of multiple multiple things. One is to have an inventory of your AI systems. 
what current AI products are you using and how is this impacting the end customer? Okay, maybe you're not using anything. Maybe you started using some, I don't know, um, C CRM tools that have predictive AI in it, or maybe using AI chatbots. So quick inventory in an Excel file to identify those tools, and then a quick description of how those tools are using customer data to improve your experience. That's a very simple table that you can deploy internally. Um, and by the way, I'm not an attorney. I'm just giving you suggestions based on what I've seen some companies implement. So please keep that in mind. Um, second is to continuously test the output of the data, especially if you deployed an AI chatbot, very relevant to us here at Vbout, because you can build AI chatbots with Vbout. Test the results to understand if the results that you're getting from the data, the training data, is biased, is accurate. So that's really important when working with your customers or your marketing or C-level suite uh, on the team uh, to, to test the data so you're not putting the company in jeopardy. There's no liability. And you should probably bring up this topic to your colleagues to say, we're deploying a chatbot, but it's not going to be as simple because we understand we need to be compliant. We understand we have to test it vigorously so there's no bias. Now, you might be thinking, how can I find out if my AI chatbot is biased or not? In that answer, but quite frankly, it's probably going to depend on the industry um, and what kind of clientele and end customers you're working with. But I think every business might identify some questions that could reveal the bias or not, and perhaps have those as a routine Q&A, okay? Now, we do give you visibility over every single question that came through, the answers that the bot have responded, and also what kind of questions the bot could not answer. So with that visibility, a weekly or bi-weekly review should be sufficient to see if the bot is messing up or the bot needs some fine tuning, or maybe you have to retrain it on a new data set and updating that, uh, and then relearning or retraining uh, the bot itself. And I just gave one example here for the AI chatbot. Maybe you have some other products that you're pushing, like content generation and stuff like that. So you need to have that sort of step-by-step -step testing that you need to be aware of. Okay. And then number three is putting all this together on your terms of service and linking those to your contracts. So if your contracts include links to the terms of services and people have to approve your terms of service before they sign up, you're very clear on, uh, on this thing. And maybe I can show you quickly uh, because we're working on this in Viva, so it's not quite live. Once we do, I'll make sure to provide it as a template for everybody. Um, but you remember when we worked with uh, the GDPR compliance framework, we had to dis uh, dis display all our, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to find it at the same time. Every single company we work with and how we handle the data is important. So we created a table, which can look like this. Okay, basic terms of services, what kind of data, you can add some options here for your AI compliance and also the companies that you're sharing data with, okay? So getting this in place and then consulting an attorney is great um, to know exactly which part of your terms of services and privacy should include how you're using and deploying AI, okay? Um, and to answer the big question, how does that affect us today? I don't think you're going to get a fine immediately. I don't think you're going to be in trouble immediately. Um, but just be prepared early. You don't want to be the last person to get on the train and you'll find yourself, you know, pressured by all sorts of, um, entities involved, like your customers or perhaps your manager 
uh, or maybe just the local legal requirements for something new that came up. If you do bit by bit and prepare yourself from now, I think that's gonna that's gonna help you long term. Second is it gives you an edge, and like uh, the attorney uh, said, Andrea, this could be an edge for you when you're selling your product and you're selling your service. And the clients sometimes they think they are smarter than us and they want to do things on their own. And why should I hire you? But you knowing these kind of legal compliances and what you need to know and how you can deploy it, honestly, will give you an edge that you can you know present it and say, hey, look, it's on you if you want to do it yourself, but understand this, you can get in trouble or you're not going to be compliant with demographics you're selling. And if you're having this conversation internally with your stakeholders, because you're not selling front facing like an agency, then obviously this is, this is an expertise that you have. And I think in the future, everybody's going to have an AI committee uh, at a company that's going to handle these kinds of stuff. So uh, I think that's it. I know this presentation, by the way, guys, has a lot more to it, um, including, let me just, Pull it up real quick. I want you to have access to it, like the potential misuses of AI and implementing compliance measures. So there are some slides I'm skipping due to the time, uh, but also George has compiled like a small resources at the end uh, that could be helpful for you. So there are some links and uh, sources that you can utilize. So thanks George for this, by the way. You're welcome. Yeah, the, th these are really helpful. Uh, they include some sheets and an example of uh, the data uh, protection assessment that uh, that can be done to uh, uh, identify any bias, potential bias that may occur in AI or any other problem. So yeah, th these are available at your disposal, guys. That's great. Awesome. Oh, I'm going to take questions. Before I do that, I want to remind you that the sponsor of this event is Vbout. Vbout is the go-to tools. If you're looking for more than SaaS product, we are a marketing tech company with 14 bundled products in one. And we work with agencies as a reseller um, model. We have an amazing multi-tenant kind of management. Many of you are using it. Or we work with SMBs with a small marketing team of one to 30 people. This is sort of like our niche. And with our 14 plus products, our flagship products are our predictive email campaigns, visual automation. And now we're pushing hard on AI chatbot and everything else are nicely sprinkled around as great features to complete your marketing stack. Uh, if you would like to speak to us to see if VBAT is a good fit, George will put a link to our demo so you can connect with our one of our sales um, a success managers and identify if we're a good fit or not. But we'd certainly love to uh, get you on board and we can work together long term. So let's take some questions, George. And by yeah, the way, sure. if it's something too legal, I'm not going to be able to answer. Uh, Andrea... Yeah, of course. And Let's that start. You can email them with your, your questions, by the way. So take him up on his 30 minutes and email some questions. Why not? <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, of course. Uh, we have a question from Manfred. Do we have a HIPAA compliance on our... George, you're breaking up, but I can, I, can, I, can, I can read it. You're breaking up for some reason. Well, HIPAA compliance is something that we're looking into. It involves multitude of layers you got to do some extensive pen testing you got to get some auditors um so i'm i'm looking heavily into it and when i say i'm looking that means i'm already proactively getting quotes and speaking to potential options um i can't promise you anything yet because unless i have things inked and engaged i do not promise anything but i am looking actively into it um that, so that's for that question george Dave, uh, you can, of course, contact uh, Andrea, but uh, Dave was asking if this is similar to uh, about the EU AI Act. 
if it's similar to GDPR, where US-based local businesses who sell, who only sell to domestic local customers, are essentially exempt from. Well, no, George, you're breaking up again. I'm sorry, but I think I I understand. If you're not selling in the EU, you do not necessarily need to be worried about all the EU compliance. But the US AI uh, law is actually not too far from it, except in how they categorize, you know, your company and and your 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 sector, etc. Um, so quite frankly, if you're not selling in the EU. Don't worry too much, but if you are selling in the United States, you probably should start with basic compliance. Uh, you know, test your products and have a routine test to make sure it's not spitting up the wrong biased results. Um, put the right terms of services, and it could be a paragraph. It doesn't have to be anything extensive. Um, and, um, you know, have like an AI committee internally. If you're one person, it's you, you, and you, and you can review things with yourself. Uh, and think about it and make decisions a lot faster. So that <laughs> that's that. Richard, can you hear me? Now I can, George, yes. Okay, great. Uh, Will, can you please uh, explain more what, what do you mean with... Um, yeah, I'm, I, we lost you, George. Uh, George, I'm sorry, we lost you. Can you hear me? Now you're back. Oh, okay. No, I was asking... Uh... Oh, we can't oh, hear you, George. And then I... Sorry. We can't hear you. I'm sorry, uh, if you want to drop in your question, Will, I'm, I'm... <laughs> George is dancing. No, please drop the chat in the chat uh, your question again. I'm sorry if I missed it. Um, yeah, George, I'm sorry. I can't see the question and we cannot hear you anymore. Is there any law surrounding having to send a chat transcript from a conversation with a chat bot? Uh, that's very specific, Manuela. Um, I mean, if you have a chat bot engaging with people, I think it's going to be a good practice to state in the chat bot introductory this is this chat is powered by AI. How can I help you? And if you're sending that conversation back, I mean, before you send the conversation to the person, uh, the transcript, there's a conversation happening between you and the consumer and the answers from the bot should probably be as, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm said, said biased a lot, so I'm gonna say unbiased as possible and the data is as accurate as possible. Now, because we are training the data in the chatbot strictly on information given by you, your Word documents, your website, I mean, there's not a lot to worry about, you know? Um, but when you're opening this to a much larger model and answering, you know, questions about politics and health and medical advice and stuff like that, you certainly uh, need to be more specific, so. I'm sorry, well, I still don't have your question. Uh, responding that you said working PDF for us or from that, oh, I'm not sure. All right, so Manfred is asking if we're collecting any personal information via the chatbot, but only using it to answer general question and answers in the financial taxation and insurance industry, is it safe to present for this use? Um, yeah. Again, I would definitely uh, ask legal, but if you're if you're collecting information, personal information from the chatbot, like first name and email, just be as explicit as you are in your forms. The concept does not change. To tell them, you know, we will be using this for one, two, three. You know, um, now Vbout, we gave you two options to use the bot form. One is to have conversational form asking a question. Can I have your first name, your last name? If you do it this way, you have to make sure you put the proper disclaimer because they cannot click on I consent. They're just going to respond. So with that being said, you probably have to say that before they provide the email. 
we give you the prompt for the form so you can customize that in Bebop, which is pretty cool. The other option is to embed the form as a whole with an option on the bottom. If you build the forms in Bebout, we, we have a consent prompt on the bottom. So if you've embedded the form as an option in the bot, then they have to click on it to submit, which is the native behavior of GDPR compliance option, okay? <clears throat> well, still, because I mean, what you need to do, and many of you have like a cookie manager now where you can say what to collect or not. So the bot is collecting data. If you did not include that the bot can be turned off from the cookie manager. Uh, and personal data is different, right? Some people, their IP is a personal data. In VBOT, we anonymize the data for you, so, uh, IP, so you can't see it but we're tracking the person's activity from page to page to page. Um, some people now are using IP to cookie. I mean, IP to cookie to company, which is connected to third party data, which you have to be specific about as well. So honestly, to save yourself from the headache, just be clear on this is an AI chatbot and put on your terms of services and privacy policy, um, a section on that. We are working on it in VBOT, so I think I will provide you guys with the templates on that as soon as they're ready, okay? <clears throat> George, I don't know if you have any questions on YouTube. I know it's not as engaged there with... Um... All good? Can you hear me? Yes. No, no, it's all good on YouTube. Uh... I told her to contact Andrea. Got it, got it. Uh, Manuela, that's a great question. Is the AI, um, is the data collected by the chatbots doesn't go back to the public AI pool correct or not? And if it stays on the local private server as per your previous screen? Great question, uh, Manuela. So um, we're using augmented models that only look at your data. It doesn't look at the information of the person. If somebody gave you a piece of information, it does not uh, go to the AI model. That stays in VBout and it follows the VBout. Obviously, how we protect the data, we don't share your data, we don't resell your data ever, ever. Um, now, the questions and answers, I have to go back to the APIs because we're using OpenAI's APIs. And we have in between a learning model, which we now optimize to be agents. Um, I think it, uh, the agent itself might have visibility on the, the documents because it needs to train the model on the existing data and then create the arrays in the sector to be able to answer. Uh, I'll probably have to dig a little bit deeper on, on that, but I, I took a note of it. Thank you for asking this, it's a great question. Any more questions, guys? Feel free to drop them. <laughs> All right, it seems like we, uh, I mean, for a legal topic, so many of you has, has, has stayed with us. That, that means that this is near and dear for many. And probably many of you are wondering, like, I'm, I'm using all these AI products being dumped on us from AI content gen to AI chatbots to a, AI uh, ad creation. Like, where do I stand? And honestly, I feel you. I, I feel the same. Um, I don't want to be <laughs> left behind uh, and, and be late to the party of, of the B2B be compliance. So with that being said, I, I get it. I get your pains. We'll provide you with the templates. You have 30 minutes free consultation with a very uh, skilled attorney. I, I think you should take him on his offer. And we will be making this presentation available on our portal uh, by tomorrow, George, please. So everybody can get access to it and repurposes as they see fit, okay? Sure, and of course. Like I promised, once we have our uh, some templates together for you, like what to include on terms of services or privacy policy or any other templates, we will also make those available. All right, uh, any other Thank questions? You. We we're having no uh, anonymous attendee say, said developed is the best. Thank you. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you, anonymous attendee. Hopefully, you're not an AI chatbot that's being biased. <laughs> cool. Um, Leland said, uh, no, I was looking for, it's not a question, it's also a compliment. Thank you, Leland. Like, uh, she didn't see any SaaS company providing resource, uh, resources or content uh, like this. Uh, thank you, Leland. Thank you. Thank you. We do it. I got to tell you, we do it from the heart. George works really hard on it and other team members as well to put these together because uh, what we learn, we want you to learn and providing, uh, providing that to you is a win-win. Why not? Awesome. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for the great <laughs> info. You're welcome, Bill. Manuela, this, this was a very timely topic. Thank you for... We're losing you, George. We're losing you, George. Sorry. Uh, I'll read it. I'll read it. So, Manuela, yes, it's, it's definitely landscape is changing extremely fast. New things coming up on the market. People are using products they don't even know the implication on. And this topic is, um, I mean... When it, how is going to impact us is is, is the the question. So um, all right. Well, th thank you everybody. Uh, I'll I'll let you go. I appreciate you uh, attending all this long and all your questions. And we'll see you on a partners meeting this month. If you want to see the latest releases in Vbout, we have some cool things coming up. Really excited about that. Um, and also. Next month, we'll have another topic. We're going to be discussing how to do email marketing in the age of AI marketing. So we're going to share with you tools, tips, stats of how to improve your email marketing results, which as old as it sounds, email marketing is still one of the biggest drivers for engagement for many people. So we'll talk about that next month. And I hope to see you then. And again, thank you for attending. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, guys. Bye.